Hello, so we're going to do chapter 25 lecture video on capital budgeting. And we're going to talk just briefly on some of the managerial decision points as well. So let's first do capital budgeting. So capital budgeting, the, the key thing to understand about capital budgeting is it's, it's long term, right? So we have our four points down here at the bottom. And, and the one that really stands out is that we're, ta we're making a long-term commitment, right? So because we do a long-term commitment, we don't know how uh, it's gonna turn out, right? So this is the outcome is uncertain. It's kind of like the weather, you know, the longer out it gets, people really can't uh, tell what the weather is gonna be exactly like, right? And so with capital budgeting, there's so many different, um, different, uh, data points and issues that may arise that you really just don't know how it's going to turn out, right? Uh, typically, also, there's larger risk, right? Because we're out in a long run, there's there that's, that's risky to begin with, even if it's just a dollar bill. But we may be talking about um, million, uh, several million, a billion dollars in long-term investments, right? So you talk about, like, for example, um, Elon Musk, uh, it built the Giga Factory, right? It's a billion dollar factory to create um, batteries out in Nevada. So that's totally a capital budgeting issue. And it's a lot of money, right? So large amounts of money are used, uh, long term commitment, of course. And then uh, number four, you may not be able to reverse it. Once you commit the dollars to that, you, you will most likely never get them back. So in order to, to look into capital budgeting, we have some methods, okay? So we have our capital budgeting methods. We have four of them that we're gonna talk about in this chapter. We're gonna talk about uh, payback period will be number one, right? We're gonna talk about that first. And then of course there's strengths and, and weaknesses or limitations on each one and exactly what each one is measuring, right? So. Uh, we also have the accounting rate of return, net present value, and internal rate of return. Okay, so with, with some of these, the, the two at the end, net present value and internal rate of return, we're really talking about time value of money uh, issues. So if you've done like, for example, the business math class, or if you've ever done future and present values, this will be helpful for you in this chapter. If not, it'll be a new thing, and hey, we'll learn together here. Okay, so first we're going to talk about the payback period. Okay, so there's there's two different ways to do payback period. It depends on if your annual net cash flows from your capital investment, this part right here, right? It depends on if that is, uh, if they come in in equal amounts, right? So, for example, uh, you may have like year one, Okay, right here, year, uh, we'll just do Y, year two, uh, year three. So if you, for example, you invest some money up front, your capital investment, and then every year you get uh, $10,000 a year, then that is where those are equal month annual uh, amounts, right? Annual net cash flow. So that's what we're talking about here. If they're, if they are uh, equal amounts and they don't change from year to year, then you're able to use this calculation right here. You're able to take the cost of your investment and you're able to divide by the annual net cash flow. So it's gonna look something like this, right? So here's our setup. We have the machine, it cost us $16,000 and it expected to produce annual net cash flows of $4,100 a year. Okay, and it's gonna have an eight year useful life with no salvage value. So now we're gonna calculate the payback period. So the question is, is when do we get our investment back, right? Not necessarily how much are we gonna make over the long term, and that's kind of one of the one of the downsides of this calculation, but it's just gonna say how quickly do we get that initial investment back? Okay, so then this is our calculation, right? Cost of investment annual net cash flows and it's going to look like this for for with these numbers plugged in right so it's going to be 3.9 uh, years okay 
if this is our annual investment. So this is a this is for the uh, annual right investment. So as we divide by the annual amount, then our answer is going to be you know 3.9 and its actual years because we're dealing in annual terms here. Okay. Now, what if we have uneven cash flows? So every year our cash uh, flow is not even like our 4100, but it's gonna be anywhere in between these amounts, right? Uh, so how do we figure out what our, uh, when our payback period is? Okay, so uh, one quick way to do it is to line it out into um, a table like this, okay? And actually amortize or um, decrease the initial investment by the annual cat net cash flow, right? So what we're doing is we're starting out with the same numbers that we had for our, our last scenario with an even cash flow. And now we're gonna throw uneven cash flows at it. So here we've got, got our 16,000. This is our initial investment right here. We're gonna subtract from that our 3,000, right? So we're subtracting and then that will give us 13,000, okay? And then we subtract from that 4,000 and that'll give us 9,000, right? So the idea is we're gonna come down uh, to zero here. So we hit zero sometime in a year, let's see, one year, two year, three, four, yeah, after year four, right? Is where we're gonna be hitting our uh, year and, and so and it just so happens that it's actually uh, 4.2 years is where it turns out to to have um, the full payback okay so it happens between years four and five it's actually 4.2 So, and here's our shortcomings, right? So it ignores the time value of money. So it doesn't say uh, that, and the time value of money concept, we're gonna talk about more later, but basically what time value of money means is a dollar bill now in our hand is worth more than a dollar bill uh, in the future, okay? So if I said, hey, I'll lend you a dollar, and you said, okay, I'll pay you back in, you know, five months or six months or five years or whatever the case is, I'll pay you that dollar back. Uh, maybe that isn't a good idea, right? Uh, you're not gonna be able to consume this dollar bill or use it or invest it. And so really the time value, the value of the time lapsed is uh, the value that whatever you put on it as somebody that's lending money, right? And so it, it, this payback period ignores that. It says, okay, it's gonna take us four year, four point two years to pay back. Well, you know, what? So, so what if I have some other things I could be using this money doing, right? So it doesn't take doesn't take that into effect. Okay, then it also ignores the cash flows after the payback period. So into the future. So we we uh, pay back, and then maybe we're gonna the next year we make uh, a huge amount of money. So this is an example right here. So we're gonna, we're, we invest $5,000. Which scenario, project one right here, or project two has the quickest payback? Well, it's project one actually, right? So we're gonna be paid back somewhere in, uh, in, the, after the, in the third year, right? So, so we're gonna be paid back. We're not gonna be paid back for project two until the fifth year right here, but look at the money in the fifth year. So if you were to look at this and say, hey, uh, which one looks better with the payback period? Obviously it would be project number one. Is that really the best project? Um, I don't think so. Maybe the million dollars at the in year five would be worth waiting for, right? Okay. So now we're gonna go on. So that's, that's payback period. It's useful for some things, right? Uh, but, uh, but it definitely has a shortcoming. So let's look at the accounting rate of return. Okay, so this one is, there. here's the equation for the accounting the rate of return. 
Okay, so there's two ways to calculate the average annual investment. Okay, so we've got the average or the annual after tax net income. Okay, so this is annual after tax net income. And then we have our annual, and this and this is this is part of estimation, right? So we have to estimate or kind of know what that what the percentage of tax is going to be, right? What what our tax rate is going to be, which which may be easy, and maybe it may change in the future. So that's kind of the risk there. But there's two ways to calculate the average annual investment, right? Okay, so here's one way to do it. So we, we have our beginning book value of investment plus ending book value divided by two. Okay, so that's straight line. So that's if, for example, you know, that's just saying, okay, beginning, ending, uh, not saying when we actually invested, right? Okay, not saying when we invested. So this is the annual average investment. Uh, when we're summing up individual years average book values and then we divide by the number of years of the planned investment okay so instead of saying hey hey this is this is the beginning year one right here this is ending book value year 10 we're actually saying here's one two three four right all the way to 10 summed up and then we're dividing by the number of years. So that possibly could give us maybe a little different answer. You can kind of see on how that, that could be a little different, especially if the timing, depending on the timing of the book values and how that works. Okay. So when comparing investments uh, with similar lives and risks, so we're talking about the similar links and, and risk uh, amounts a company will prefer investment with a higher accounting rate of return obviously right they want a higher return uh, but th there's a lot of if right there's a lot of if the lives are the same and if the risk is the same so really it's similar type projects for similar amount the accounting rate of return will work for you so here we here we are this is the same investment we were talking about before and now we're talking about annual after-tax net income so different different than our cash flows, right, that we had saw before, okay? So we're now, we're, and we're gonna compute the accounting rate of return. So here's basically the book value. Beginning book value is 16,000. Ending book value, zero, right? So it has no book value at the end, and we're gonna divide that by two. Okay, $8,000. Okay, now we're gonna plug it into this equation. So here's the accounting rate of return. So we have our annual after-tax net income, which we get from here, and we're gonna divide it by the annual average investment, and that's gonna get us 26.25% uh, return, okay? So not bad, maybe not good, it just depends on what we compare it with, right? So, um, so anyway, so these are some of the limitations that go with it. Uh, it. So it may vary from year to year, right? So it may vary. And really we're assuming with the calculation that we had before that, that the net income would be, would be constant, equal, which it may not be. So also there's also the accounting rate ignores the time value of money. So it still doesn't, doesn't take in the time value of money. That'll be our next one that we're gonna talk about, which is net present value. So we're netting this out and we're using present value to, to give us uh, the time value of money uh, effect into our calculation. All right, okay, so net present value analysis, okay, applies the time value of money to future cash inflows and cash outflows. So it could be in or out depending if we're still investing in the project or if we're getting income from it so that management can evaluate a project's benefits and costs at one point in time. So wherever that point is, they're gonna, they're gonna um, figure out the present value at the, for, 
at that point. So, so net present value, or NPV as it is called, is computed by discounting the future net cash flows from the, and this is a, this is a, a terminology. So here, let's, let's bring this out up here. So we're discounting the future net cash flows from the investment at the required. So let's say, so here's our years again. So let's say year, uh, so this is times zero. This is present, okay? This is present value times zero. And then one year out, year one, two years out, year two, uh, and then let's say year three. We'll go out there. Okay, so what it what it's doing is is it is discounting back. So let's say that there's some value over here. So let's say it's a let's say it's a dollar. Okay. Okay. Let's let's say this is a dollar over here. So we're getting this income every year of a dollar. So what is the dollar worth in the present in the present over here, right? So what we do is we discount back the dollar in the future back to the present. So we're taking this back and we're saying this dollar is actually worth to us presently 98 cents or something like that right and this this one in year two is worth only since it's further out it's maybe worth 95 cents okay and the year three it's going to be worth even less maybe it's worth uh, 85 cents something like that right so and, and this is and I'm, I'm just kind of uh, doing the concept here but what we'll do is we'll plug in numbers and in your book there's actually uh, factor tables that you can use. You can also do uh, present value calculations in Excel, net present value even, and um, so all of these things. So all of these, all of these are worth, right? As we discount these, this dollar back, and we're going to do some more examples. They're all worth a certain amount. Well, the way it works is, we discount them back, sum them up, right? So here's the sum. We sum up our discounted cash values and we subtract the initial amount of investment. So let's say uh, the initial amount of investment was a dollar. So I give you a dollar, you give me a dollar for every year for three years out. Sounds like a pretty good investment, but the net present value of that is now uh, our maybe let's say our 98 cents plus our 95 cents plus our 85 cents. And then we subtract out the dollar that we uh, gave and that is our net present value so does that make sense that's kind of what the what net means right so you're gonna subtract out the initial amount that you uh, invested to in, as a capital project to in order to get you into the uh, ability to then generate those r income flows uh, into the future so so we have our um, so we have what's called a required rate of return. Let me let me erase all this here at the bottom. I made a mess and made a bunch of things here. Okay. Okay. So the the uh, required rate of return is uh, something that's internal at a company. Okay. So it, it could be different by company so the, the way the way the required rate of return works and it's also called it's often called a hurdle rate so what that means is that's what you're discounting the uh, like those dollar bills that I had out there that's the there's a percentage that you use to discount those back and that's the required rate or the percentage of return uh, also called the hurdle rate or hurdle, hurdle percentage and internally in a company, it says, okay, we need to be able to make, for example, 5% uh, on our investment or 10% or 20%, whatever it is. Um, it's going to be different. Like, say, for example, if you're Google, your your internal rate of return or your hurdle rate is going to be different than maybe McDonald's is, right? McDonald's is investing in, in real estate and in uh, the food fast food business, whereas Google 
is all about online and so and there's ex different expectations for investments from each company but that's really what the required rate of return is a company requires a certain return on the investment of their capital okay so that's what that is and so and so here we go here's our and then we're, we're assuming here in this scenario that the net cash flows are equal okay so the net cash flows right here are going to be equal as they go down okay so these are equal and then what we do here is just like I was doing before so year one we're gonna we're gonna discount that back to uh, time zero or the present value so we go 4100 times the present value factor of one or a dollar. So each dollar in the $4,100 is going to be uh, basically multiplied by 0.8929, which basically is going to reduce it down. Each dollar will be reduced down to uh, basically 89.29% of itself. So um, then, then what we're going to do is we're going to uh, come up with, and, and then that's this is the answer, right? So we're multiplying it by the factor. So where do we get these factors? We get them in the back of the book. So we look in the textbook. It's in Appendix B, I believe, is where it's at. So in Appendix B, you have uh, present value factor tables, okay? And they've already done the math for you. There's, there is also, you can also look up present value uh, calculations or equations. So you can plug in your time, your percentage, uh, your net cash flows, and it'll discount it back for you if you plug it into the equation correctly. But we're just doing concepts here. And, and so you can use those present value tables to, to solve the problems that you have for this chapter. And, um, and, and so anyway, so you can, you can do that. And you get your net present, uh, net present value at the end here as you, after you multiply all these. So we're multiplying all these across, right? Okay, and then, then we're going we're gonna to do the equal sign for each one of these, right? So they're all coming over here as an equal okay and here and then we're going to add them up so we're adding all these up here and it equals twenty thousand three hundred sixty seven dollars is what it actually equals so it's really not this thirty two thousand eight hundred right so that thirty two thousand eight hundred is actually converted year after year as it discounts each year it's actually converted over to this twenty thousand three hundred sixty seven dollars that is the present value of the cash flows. Now we need to convert it then to net present value, which it means that we have to subtract, right, the initial investment, which is $16,000 right here, right? So we're subtracting that, and that gives us net present value. Okay, so positive net present value tells us, wow, this actually meets our hurdle rate. That's what it's telling us. It, it gives us, uh, if, it, if it was zero, then it just meets the hurdle rate exactly. If it is greater than zero, the net present value is greater than zero, then that means, yep, that's one that we could invest in, given our hurdle rate for our uh, company, okay? So that's, it says it should invest in the machine. So here's the, um, the question or the the scenario this is kind of a graphic that just basically lays out what I just said right present value of present value of net cash flows so this here's the it's not netted yet so we, we subtract the amount invested gives us the net present value and then we say if it's greater than zero accept if it's less than zero reject so uh, when we when we compare several different ones it's saying here at the bottom we're really looking at the one that gives us the highest positive net present value. So that's one thing when you compare um, projects one to another. So what happens, so that was the scenario that said, what if all the cash flows were even? 
Well, now we're going to say, what if they're uneven? Okay. So what that's what that's uh, what that has us do is we can't necessarily plug um, all these in and say, okay, uh, this is if they're all even, then we can just use what's called the uh, the uh, present value of an annuity at one. We can do that with uh, if they're all even. Now what we have to do is we have to discount each year back separately, okay? Each year back separately. But this scenario that we have here is set, it, it says, okay, what if we have a, a project, right? And it's a similar project, but for one, one scenario, we get our money earlier in the timeline. One, it gets pushed back later in the timeline. Year, the other one, maybe we get our money uh, evenly throughout. So which scenario would you pick, right? So A is the one that's even throughout, right? This is even. Here's an uneven cash flow, but it's front loading the front loading the money. And then C here is has more money on the back end, right? So which one is worth more to us? Well, obviously if if we understand the concept of time value of money, Money that we get sooner is worth more. Okay, it takes takes the risk out, it's worth more to us. So obviously B, as we multiply these numbers here by our present value factors here, right? This is our present value factors. We multiply them by these. That gives us our answers on B, and that's the one we want. Because it has the highest net present value, $908 versus the other ones. Okay, so so one one possible way to, uh, to compare things when you're using time value of money, right, is to use what's called a profitability index. Okay, and so th this is the calculation for a profitability index. So we're plugging these numbers here in, and we're coming out with the the profitability index. Uh, number two is going to be greater, right? It's going to be it has the best profitability index out of the mix, right? So anything above one would be would be uh, good. Okay. So now now we're doing internal rate of return, or talking a little bit more about an internal rate of return. So the internal rate of return, we and we've talked about this before, this is what makes the present value uh, equal to zero, right? So that tells us not only, or, so we had talked about our hurdle rate, so that's not the internal rate of return, just to clear things up, right? internal rate of return is actually telling us, okay, what is the actual return or the percentage of return on this investment, right? Net present value lets us know if it meets our hurdle rate, right? Or re required rate of return, sorry. But this, this calculation or this process tells us what is the actual rate of return? What's the actual internal rate of return? And so what we do here is we say, take our net our present value of cash inflows, subtract our initial investment, and it's zero. So what percent makes that zero? And that will tell us exactly what the IRR, or the internal rate of return is. Okay, that's exactly what the internal rate of return is, is whatever makes all of our time value money calculations for net present value zero. So here's our, here's our scenario. We've got a project that's three years, Initial cost twelve thousand bucks. Annual net cash inflows is five thousand. So now we need to determine what the internal rate of return for this is. So we and we've got uh, even cash flows, which makes this nice. Okay. So we've got our um, our present value factor, right? Is going to be so our twelve thousand divided by our five thousand per year is two point four. We identify the discount 
rate yielding the present value factor. Okay, so we're gonna go to our uh, factor tables, okay? And we're gonna figure out what our factor, uh, where we can find close to 2.4 on our factor tables. So we know that it's a three year it's a three-year investment. So we are able to pick out the three-year line. So this is three years. And then we go across, we say, nope, it's not 1%, 2.9, right? That's too high. No, nope, not 5%, 10%. Uh, oh, we're getting close, 12%. That's about the closest one, okay? And so that's one way to do it is to, to go into your, there, there, and there's other ways to do this, but uh, that's one way to do it is to go into your, uh, your actual uh, factor tables at the back of your book, Appendix B, pick out the period and go across the row and find the, find the, um, the factor that's closest to what you computed. Okay. So, so what if we have uneven cash flows, right? right? Before, let me go back to here. This is the present value of an annuity. So annuity is used for even cash flows when you use the factor table. Present value of annuity is used for even cash flows, okay? And a single calculation of the of what the cash flow is annually multiplied by this factor would give you the the present value of all cash flows. Okay, so that's an annuity, right? Annuities every year, every annual period, one after the other. So that's an annuity. Uh, now what we're looking at here is something different. So this is uneven cash flows. So, and we, and we have to calculate the um, internal rate of return, okay? So calculating the internal rate of return becomes much more difficult when a project has unequal cash flows. If cash flows are unequal, it is best to either use a calculator or a spreadsheet software. So you can use Excel is a really good one. It has in the in its functions IRR calculation, and you can plug in all of your all of your cash flows and your and your initial cash flows and come up with the IRR, the internal rate of return. So, we, however, we can we can also use trial and error to compute the IRR. Uh, we do this by selecting it, any reasonable discount rate and computing the net present value. If the amount is positive. We, we uh, or negative, right? We recompute the net present value using a higher or lower number uh, discount rate. Hand calculations using interest rate tables involve multiple trial and error solutions. For this reason, electronic spreadsheets are a lot easier, right? So you go ahead and calculate net present value. If it's zero, then whammo, you did it, right? That equals internal rate of return. Okay, if it's uh, greater than, right, then your number was too low on this side, your, your rate was too low. If it's, uh, if it's less than zero, right, then your number was too high, your, your hurdle rate was too high, and so your guess was too high, and so, so anyways, that's, that's a, kind of a trial and error way to do it but it's just as easy to do it in Excel. So, so anyways, um, that is, that's kind of what we wanted to talk about. So those are our four, um, our four capital budgeting methods. Okay, and while we'll go through the assignment set and do it together, and I think I'll also, as part of the assignment set, I'll throw in how to use Excel's internal rate of return and net present value functions and just give you a kind of a look at what that looks like as well. So we'll talk to you later. Have a good evening.